Hi, everyone. My name is Alex Reich, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, which provide independent, objective advice to inform policy with evidence, spark progress and innovation, and confront challenging issues for the benefit of society. In keeping with this mission, we're excited to host conversations about issues related to policy action on climate change. I'd like to acknowledge that the National Academy's Washington, D.C. headquarters is physically housed on the traditional land of the Nequantitank and Piscataway peoples past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have been its stewards throughout the generations. We honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these peoples and nations and this land and acknowledge that the expertise held by different Native communities is crucial to the work of understanding and addressing climate change. I'd also like to welcome you to the inaugural Ramanathan Climate Conversation held in honor of National Academy of Sciences member Virapadran Ram Ramanathan, who's participating today. Recognizing that climate change is a global challenge that requires global solutions, the Ramanathan Climate Conversations are going to focus on climate resilience in South and East Asia, while aiming to identify pathways to action that are relevant to viewers and policymakers around the world. Today's event will set the stage with future Ramanathan climate conversations focusing on different aspects of climate change in South and East Asia, like sea level rise, air pollution, or population demographics. These annual webinars are made possible through the generosity of the scientist Sunanda Basu, and we're delighted to have this time to speak with Ram and understand how he's thinking about the topics he's spent his life working on. Our conversation today will be recorded and available to view right here after the event. If you'd like to ask questions, please submit them in the box below the video at any time, and we'll incorporate them in the final 20 minutes. We also encourage you to participate in the polls that will appear in that same location and to give your feedback after the event in the survey linked above the video. Before we begin, I'd also like to invite you to join us on December 7th for a climate conversation about how to sustain a viable insurance system amidst worsening climate hazards in the US and about the roles that communities, policymakers, and the insurance industry itself can play in reducing community vulnerability over the coming decades. The link to register is above where you can also sign up for our newsletter to get notified about all our upcoming climate activities at the academies. But for today, I'm so pleased to be joined by Maria Di Cristina, Dean of the College of Communication at Boston University and former Editor-in-Chief of Scientific American. Maria was kind enough to moderate a number of previous climate conversations and she'll interview Ram today. Thank you again for joining the National Academies for Climate Conversations. Maria, it's all yours. Thanks so much, Alex, for the lovely welcome. With the Earth's average temperature having increased by over one degree C since 1900, this year saw an extreme heat wave in India, the worst drought record on, uh, on record in China, and a third of Pakistan uh, flooded. As the UN Climate Change Conference, COP27, nears its conclusion in Egypt this week, issues of equity and human health caused by a warming world have certainly been front and center. Asia contains more than half the global population and emits more than half of the world's emissions. Critically, as we've already seen, the impacts of climate change on people in the region are already severe. And what happens in Asia will have a large impact on what happens to our planet and to all of its people. To help us to better understand our paths forward together, I'm really uh, delighted to welcome our speaker today, Ram Ramanathan, who is Freeman Endowed Presidential Chair in Climate Sustainability Emeritus at the University of California, San Diego, and Climate Solutions Scholar, Cornell University. He is an international leader in climate studies. His discoveries about atmospheric gases have helped provide a foundation for addressing climate change. His findings have led to numerous climate solution policies, including the formation of the Climate and Clean Air Act Coalition by the United Nations and the bipartisan ratification of the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol by the US and other nations. He was the science advisor to Pope Francis's delegation to the Paris Climate Summit, focusing on climate justice for the poorest 3 billion of the world. He is founding chair of the Bending the Curve Climate Solutions Education Program at the University of California. Welcome to you, Ram. Thank you, Mariette. Uh, I want to thank the Academy uh, for this a superb honor of starting a lecture in my name. And I also want to thank distinguished scientists and my friend, 
uh, Dr. Sulanda Basu for, for her generosity in starting this uh, fellowship. Thanks so much, Ram. Let's start with the big picture. Um, can you give us a quick recap of where we are now with climate change? Yes. Um, let me take a minute, uh, Maria, to give a background about how we are changing the mighty monsoons, changing the mighty hurricanes, melting glaciers, etc. Uh, to give a personal example, right after this talk, I'm going to take an Uber to the service station to get my car. It's about 10 miles away. The gas my car would burn is basically what we call hydrocarbons. It has hydrogen and oxygen, I mean, carbon and hydrogen. And the carbon combines with carbon dioxide in the air to become carbon dioxide. It's one of the most insidious gas I can think of because once you emit it, 50% of it stays for 100 years and about 20% stays for 1,000 years. So my Uber car will be creating a problem which will last thousands of years. And what happens, this carbon dioxide covers the entire planet like a blanket. And just like a blanket on a warm night, a cold night, it keeps you warm by trapping your body heat. This blanket of carbon dioxide traps the heat coming from the earth and the atmosphere, and that's how the warming entire planet, okay? And don't let this blanket uh, a metaphor fool you. Since this gas accumulates over hundreds of years, we have dumped about 1 trillion tons of this carbon dioxide into there. That's what is above your head. It's a huge problem we created. Around 2013 to 16, the planet heated up, warmed by a degree. And mind you, that was predicted. It was very close to what the models had predicted at, the, at that time. That one degree Celsius, in addition to rising sea level, has caused huge climate uh, and weather extremes. And just the number of weather extremes in the last 50 years has increased fivefold. And the economic cost of that over the 50 years is close to three and a half trillion dollars, okay? And, and the economic cost also have increased sevenfold. So we are not talking about 5% here, 10% there. We are talking about huge magnitude. I just so I, I hear it's a blanket. I love yes. that image, super helpful. And also the enormous scale of the challenge. Could could we touch base a little on, you know, ways so and especially with, with COP winding up, we've talked about cutting carbon emissions and taking other approaches called mitigation. And I, I'd love to hear a little bit about mitigation options and why they're just not enough. Yeah. Uh so what are we doing about this climate crisis, which is already upon us? The main line of attack of this problem in the last 20, 30 years is mitigation. That is, the emissions are causing this, cut down the emissions, okay? And the focus on cutting down the emissions is mainly on carbon dioxide, which is, which is it's a, like I said, uh, the gas which is causing a lot of mischief, but, 40% of the warming we have experienced comes from gases other than carbon dioxide, okay? And until about 1970s, we thought CO2 is the only gas we have to worry about. As a uh, postdoctoral fellow, I ran into this, uh, accidentally into this discovery that there are other gases we are putting in the atmosphere. They're called halocarbons. The main one is CFCs. They, are used, they were used as refrigerants but they were also damaging the ozone layer, so they have been banned as uh, since then. But right now, these non-CO2 gases, some, most of them, uh, you know, short-lived, we call them short-lived super pollutants, and we know how to cut them, okay? So what has emerged, Marriott, is a three-lever strategy. The first level is decarbonizing the economy, cut down CO2 emissions. How do you do that? make the planet fossil free, use other abundant energy source. The second is cut the short-lived climate pollutants, which is methane, hydrofluorocarbons used as refrigerants, and ozone and soot particles. Okay, the third 
is what I call ACE, A-C-E. That's the ACE lever we have. Remember, we already put a trillion tons. We got to take out at least a third of it. We have to thin the blanket. So that's what the mitigation strategy is. Returning from mitigation and, and why it's not enough, I know you also counsel taking additional steps. Can we talk about those? Yes. Uh, like I said, the climate crisis is already upon us, okay? And it's going to get a lot worse, a lot sooner than we think. How soon? There's a paper published by my, uh, uh, my team of us, uh, three of us, uh, Dr. Professor uh, Yang Yang Shu from Texas A&M and Professor David Victor from UCSD. We predicted, this is 2018, we are going to, the warming will amplify by 50% and cross the one and a half degree threshold by 2030, eight years from now. That's a 50% amplification. I'm suggesting that that will be the COVID moment or this Me Too movement for climate change. Everyone would be impacted. And no matter how fast we cut the emissions, we can bend the curve, but it's going to take us about 20, 25 years to bend the curve, even if we start actions now, which means we have to prepare society for the thing getting worse and worse, at least for the next 20 years. So what we need to do, in addition to mitigation, we need to bring up adaptation as a one main focal point for uh, you know, helping people cope and adapt to this climate change. And, and you know, you, you just touched on it, perhaps, uh, you know, society itself. So we're mitigating, we're adapting. You also uh, counsel society to begin to think about things a bit differently as well. Could we touch on that? Thanks, Mariette. Uh, you know, the, the new way of addressing the climate change issue is called resilience, climate resilience. It's got, it's got three pillars, okay? So the resilience, we all intuitively know, what do we mean by resilience? To bounce back from a catastrophe or shocks, okay? So we need to mitigate, to cut down, reduce the risks. That still has to be in the center. So the three pillars, first is mitigation. The second is adaptation. So what do we mean by adaptation? reduce the vulnerability of the population to the risk, reduce the exposure of the population. If the sea level is rising, don't build your house on the coast, move away from the coast, okay? And the third pillar, it's just as equally important, but not as much recognized in the worldwide negotiations is societal transformation. Let's not fool ourselves, the required changes are so huge, we need to transform society. And I can talk later about how we do the transformation. So those are the three pillars we need. And, and, and later we can talk about it. I, I'm, I'm quite delighted and excited that yesterday, California released a exactly similar plan for $54 billion building resilience. Thanks, Ram. We'll come back to that one. So I, I love this uh, helpful intro with the idea of the gases that are like a warming blanket and a three pillar response, mitigation, adaptation, and ultimately societal transformation. Uh, these are short words uh, that encompass a lot of activity. I want to just remind people for, uh, that, um, you know, as we, as Ram and I now to start to dive a little deeper into these issues, that please feel free to put questions into the Q&A box uh, whenever you feel so moved. So Ram, uh, you know, getting back to uh, exploring these issues in a bit more depth. You know, when we're talking about climate change and disruption, you know, Asia and regions uh, within Asia are, are particular interest. We, we you know, flagged it at the beginning, but can you tell us more about that? Yeah, uh, let's just get a perspective on Asia. You, you beautifully covered some of that. It has 60% of the population. And just between China and Japan and India, they have the second, the third, and the fifth largest economy in the world. Okay, it's a huge uh, force. 
Asia by itself is responsible about half of the emission now, 50%, okay? And uh, it's also two thirds of the agriculture production is done in Asia. So it's a major, if not a dominant uh, continent in the planet, okay? Just between East and South Asia, which is our focus, 80% of the population is there, but they also suffered some of the worst consequences of climate change just between East and South Asia. Nearly half of all climate change related deaths happen in Asia. And one third of this 3.6 million trillion happened in Asia. What I wanted to bring to attention is the issue of inequality, Mariette. It's a big, huge issue for the climate change as a whole. The top wealthy 1 billion have contributed 50% of the emissions. That is poor as 3 billion of the planet who are still accessing firewood and dung to meet basic needs like cooking and heating. Their contribution is just 5% to these emissions but they are the most vulnerable. Asia has one and a half billion people in this poorest category, okay? So that throws all kinds of challenges on mitigation and adaptation. Thank you. I'd like to hear some, you know, I think, I think for the audience, it'd be helpful to hear some examples of things that are happening, case studies in, in China, you know, or the indo gangetic region of Pakistan, India, Nepal, and Bangladesh of adaptation and managing climate change? Yeah, yes. uh, thank you. I think one of my suggestion and recommendation to the Academy is that in this lecture series, we focus on two regions so that we can get specific. First is China, and it made by itself is the largest emitter of uh, greenhouse gases but also a powerhouse in terms of renewable technology. And the second region is the so-called Indo-Gangetic Plains. It extends all the way from the, on the Western side, Pakistan, across the entire North India into Nepal and Bangladesh. And it's the most fertile uh, region of, in Asia. But on the boundary, Northern boundary are sitting this huge mountain ranges, Himalayas and Tibet. They call the third pole because they contain the largest ice mass after the Arctic and the Antarctic. These Himalayan glaciers are melting rapidly. They are also free major rivers, Indus, the Ganges, and that's where the Indo-Gangetic plains, okay? So in terms of see how would these people adapt? And what's happening there is compounding e events. Just like you said, uh, China and India suffered the longest heat wave ever in its history. It went on for weeks and months. And Pakistan did the same thing, but then it was followed by a flood. So now we have to talk about how do we deal with this compounding events? I find it, Marriott, convenient to think about it in the following sense. We got to think of three separate populations, interdependent, but they're separate, the wealthy 1 billion, then the middle 4 billion, middle income, and the poorest 3 billion. This is for the whole planet. A similar division exists in India. So for the poorest 1.5 to 2 billion in India, in, in, sorry, in East and South Asia, they may need is energy access. There are huge programs called energy access, but what's not thought through is that it's just not energy access, it's affordability. They can't afford this. They have never paid for fuel, okay? But if you don't do that, and they go to fossil fuels to, to beat the climate adaptation issue the next 20 years, their emissions alone would heat up the planet by degrees, several degrees. So that's one. The second is the middle income, for them to deal with heat stress, you know, cooling, they mostly live in cities. And the other biggest issue I think they're going to face is health effects, particularly mental health effects, losing their homes, losing their loved ones are all around them. So we need to prepare them for that. And that comes to the wealthy 1 billion 
I think their focus has to be on behavioral change to stop the reduce their consumptions and then contribute to the mitigation issue. Okay. So do I have, can I take a minute to go into some specifics of what exactly needs to be done? Yes, please. So what I would say is that overall resilience, let's say that if I was living in Delhi, I, I, I grew up in a small, small town in South India. What I would need first early warning systems. If I'm a farmer, two thirds of India is in farming. Some, you know, head start on these disasters. At least two days before a storm is going to hit me. Okay, early warning system, not just put in media, but delivered to people. The second I would need is climate education for all. We just need to educate everyone, all the way from kindergarten to adulthood. The third issue is water security. Droughts and floods both reduce the water quality of the water, okay, and pollute the water floods. So we need climate smart agriculture. There are numerous technologies and ways to do that, increase the agriculture yield because of the droughts, okay? And the last, next I wanna address is the agriculture and food security. Remember I said two thirds of the world food production happens in Asia, and it also is sitting with two billion poor. What's happening worldwide is that we throw a third of the food into landfill in Western nations, but in regions like South Asia, the food is just lost, just in the process of transporting and storing. So we have to ban throwing food waste into landfill because they convert to methane, which is the potent greenhouse gas. So we need to figure out a way to take the farm manure and the food waste into biodigesters and then monetize it. That could provide the fuel for the uh, uh, rural community. The last thing I want to mention is another thing major happening, uh, and it is extremely critical for Asia. We have to decentralize energy distribution. If you have huge, massive power station and that's hit by a hurricane or a cyclone, the entire region plunges into darkness. So the move now is decentralized that energy and that will work fantastic in South Asia because there are 800 million are living in villages, okay? So those are some of the things we would start the, start the adaptation. What I'm saying is not that different from what's being discussed in COP27, but what I would want to see that resilience, the new thing I'm adding is, there is just not one people think of that there are three planets sitting there, the top billion, the middle income who are living in cities and wage earners and the poorest three billion. I'm glad you mentioned COP27 because we've already got some questions along these lines, uh, Ram, and, and I find that framework of the, the top, middle, and uh, poorest three billion super helpful as well. Um, you know, thinking about what's happening in Egypt right now and, and what you would like to see happen, you know, what are some of the key things you hope will come out of the negotiations, especially with those challenges in Asia now? It's sort of happening already what I'm going to tell you, but not with the intensity. I think all the leaders and the policymakers now have to recognize that mitigation and adaptation are two sides of the same coin. If you're trying to mitigate to protect people and protect ecosystem, you also think about adaptation because climate crisis is already there. The wealthy billion can manage on their own. I just have more air conditioning or you know, stop traveling during the middle of the day, but that's not an option for the poorest or even the middle income. Okay, so adaptation has to be on the same level as mitigation, number one. The second is we need to develop guidelines for loss and damage. One third of Pakistan under flood, tens of thousands lost their homes. Who pays for it? Okay, so, if, so we have to figure out a scientifically defensible way to uh, to come with a way how to 
provide that loss and damage? Who pays for it? How much? Okay. It's being discussed and there are a lot of protests, but I have not seen yet a draft plan. That has to be the second thing I'd like to see come out of that. Third, this is my pet thing. I, I'll repeat it every 30 seconds. We have to provide clean energy for the poorest 3 billion. They're not gonna be able to pay for it. There's no sense I'm gonna give them access, take an electricity wire and run it up to the village. You have got to give it to them for free because they don't have the money to pay for it. But how can it come? Because the, the, the poorest 3 billion, if we help them, can figure out a ways to take the carbon out of the air and store it in the agriculture soil. There's enormous capacity in the soil to suck up the CO2. So there are ways to do it, clever uh, business, successful ways to do it. Um, thank you, Ram. I'd like to kind of build on this area that we're discussing now. Uh, appreciate it. And, and you know, with the frameworks you've you've just suggested in mind and thinking ahead, you know, it seems to me we know what we need to do in many ways, but not exactly how to do it. And you just touched on, for instance, scientifically defensible ways to decide who pays. You know, who's in charge here? Scientists, policymakers, the public, you know, what are the next steps that different stakeholders can take? And by the way, folks, keep putting the questions in there. Appreciate it. Ram, over to you. Mariet, you are asking me a question I've been asking myself for the last five years. I haven't found an answer. The problem has become so complex. Mm -hmm. There is climate change. There is this inequality issue which permeates everything, including within the America that is poor, that is middle, that is wealthy. And then there is another thing is that climate change is you know, uh, killing many species and it's called the biodiversity, okay? Combination of population, combination of consumption. We are in, supposed to be in a major extinction, sixth extinction is what it's called, okay? And then the societal transformation. So we build a society so that we are sustainable for generations to come. So I'm looking at it and I'm saying, who is in charge? And it's not clear. You know, the United Nations is the only agency which is discussing it. And it's being discussed in some developed nations. But remember the thing about climate change, it's like COVID, infection anywhere is a pandemic everywhere. Emissions anywhere is global warming everywhere. So it, it is interconnects all of us. So it's not clear who is in charge and, and who is keeping track of this. But I think, Mariette, uh, academic communities like you and I, uh, national academies and research agencies, have a huge role to play, okay? First, on the education issue. We have a huge role to play in the societal transformation through education. I'm not talking about conducting an undergraduate course for everyone. We have to figure out a way how to deliver it. And later I can get into it if you want. Faith communities have a huge role to play academic communities and faith communities and policymakers working together. You know, we call disciplinary science, then we call interdisciplinary science, where we go across our departments and collaborate. What I'm talking about is transdisciplinary science, where we bring in, I see a nice office behind you, community leaders, faculty, researchers, and we find out from the communities what problems are they facing. And most of the solutions I must say, I'm proud to say as an academic are being done by uh, academics, but they have not succeeded or they don't know how to do it. See, we know what to do. I don't think we are academics are trained to figure out how to do it. Okay, that's where the collaboration with the community, the private industry, that's one. The second thing where academics play a huge role is scaling up solutions. Maria, just talking about the technology issue, 
there are tremendous amount of technologies that are being developed in academic setting, both for decarbonizing and for cutting shortly pollutants and for uh, extracting the carbon. There are thousands. I don't know which can scale. So taking from the individual lab out in the street is where there is huge bottle and academic settings, particularly academic leader, leaders like deans, vice chancellors, they have to get involved and figure out which of these solutions scalable and get funding to scale them up. So those are the two ways uh, academics can help. It is still not clear to me who is in charge here for these complex set of problems. You know, governments are there, but our government leaders change every four years in US. Other countries, maybe five or six years. So this is the problem we need continuity. It's not a four year problem. It's a hundred year problem. Ram, I love this powerful idea about uh, you know how climate change being like like COVID or pandemic in a way, and that an infection in one place is a problem for all. Is that that it's quite helpful when we think about communities and how we respond. So continuing along the lines of how we respond, I want to touch uh, more on something you raised earlier about uh, you know, and you're you're physically located there in California. Uh, I would like to, to come back to that, but also, you know, more broadly, as we in the U.S. considered the difficulties around climate change in Asia, we also have to think about the political realities in which we currently operate. So maybe with California as one model, how can, how can we work to advance action on climate change despite existing tensions, too, in the region? What advice what might you might share uh, for U.S. policy leaders? I think you see, uh, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, it's, we all know this, so I don't have to be a political scientist to make this statement. America is divided, no matter what the issue is. That's the way I see it sitting in my little office here, okay? So, so climate change, unfortunately, has gotten politicized originally in US, but I think it's spreading elsewhere, that we have been put into one of these two bas baskets which divides America, okay? So uh, I think this is an area again where researchers have to go across their own departments from natural science, social science into humanities, okay? We have to figure out how to unpack climate change for all the other issues that divide us, okay? Number one, that's the issue of what to do. Now I let me just how to do it. We have to find a politically neutral forum to communicate this disaster which is already upon us and ways to solve it. And I have found that faith leaders and faith-based institutions, churches, synagogues, mosques, temples, can play a huge role in communicating this to the public. Because remember in a democracy, the leaders can't get ahead of the public. It is a top-down and bottom-up approach, right? So we can facilitate the bottom-up approach. And I, I found this because I've been affiliated with the Vatican, for the last 18 years, when I turned 60, ages ago, I received a, a communication from Pope John Paul II, you know, who is now the saint, to join the Pontifical Academy of Science. And there I discovered how my responsibility is just not to do the science, but also seek solutions, okay? So because of that, I get invited to a lot of churches and both Catholic and evangelical church. I, I once met 250 evangelicals, all skeptical, skeptical about climate change. I want to tell you my experience. I expected 
to be beaten up with eggs and this by the time I leave. But at the end of it, many of them came to me and said, Dr. Ram, we didn't know there is so much science behind climate change. See, the entire group I meet in churches, they think climate change is just a, you know, a flaky science. They don't even know there is science behind it. There's data behind it. Mm. So there's a lot of work to be done. So I'm not discouraged. I think it's just that we have not taken the effort to communicate to the public. We have left it to our media, but our media has become polarized. I find, found, you know, when I whenever I go to churches, I meet with the small group. I haven't found anyone who reads New York Times or any of the papers. So there's a lot of work to be done. And, uh, but that revolution can start in universities too, where people, climate science, goes across the street and goes to a communication department. Please help me. Um, yeah, thanks for the invitation. I'd be delighted. Uh, Ram, uh, just thinking about these ways of building bridges across, you know, divided potentially populations in America also makes me think about, uh, you know, Asia has its own regional differences, governance. So can, what can we say about the role of governance um, in Asia as a huge and diverse region, um, you know, with nations that have different political systems, how can they then, you know, are, are there lessons we can take from what, what we're doing potentially here to use there? Let me touch, I, I'll come to that. Let me touch on one thing. I gave example of America. Mm. I find the same, I, I, in terms of the community, knowing the communities a little better, I think India is probably where I have more exposure. Although in academics, I have a lot of Chinese and uh, East Asian academic scientists. But focusing on the public, I find in India, the private sector completely <laughs> not unaware, or at least the wealthy Indians not aware of the seriousness of the climate change, and they're not aware of how they can help. So this sort of communication, particularly in a, a religious country like India, would work going through the faith leaders there. Okay, and I would think the same thing with Pakistan, with the you know mosques and etc. So coming back to uh, you know. Uh, the issue you asked me, we have now several ways we can proceed, okay, on the governance issue. Let me take the Indo-Gangetic Plains, the headwaters of the rivers, which feed that entire billion population in terms of river water and rain, are interconnected. The glaciers start, start in China and flows across India and then goes to Pakistan or India, Nepal. So what I would like to see South and East Asia do is to form a joint commission. Okay, how are they going to deal with this transdisciplinary issues of sharing water? Because when the glaciers right now are still about not halfway, when the start half of the glaciers are melted, then the problem would start, okay, huge. It will be a runaway effect. That is what's called gloves, glacier uh, lake uh, flooding, you know, just like a, a massive ice sheets coming down. So they're gonna create huge problems. And they're forecasting, so by 2040, something like 50 million climate refugees will have to be uh, taken care of just in South Asia. So how are they gonna deal with this movement of people, sharing the rivers? So that sort of commission, I don't think it exists. I hope they start. Just don't focus on climate. There are such cross boundary issues and political issues, but I'm just talking about focusing on climate and sharing natural resource. That's something I would like to see that immediately happening. 
And the second, uh, I think in US, National Academy and agencies like the National Science Foundation, NOAA and NASA, we have a, a exchange scientific program of working with scientists in South and East Asia. You know, we did that during the Cold War Russia. I remember as a postdoc, I went to Russia on this exchange, National Academy. Uh, and we kept the communication going with the Russian scientists during the Soviet Union days. So uh, as you know, there are a lot of political conflicts between these regions, but science can transcend it, okay? And uh, one area they can really benefit from America is that early warning systems, you know, having that distributed monitoring, et cetera. So I think I'd like to see a scientific collaboration on this governance issue and where conversation can happen even if the political situation becomes dramatically worse. And then South Asia, of course, they have to bring in China because the glaciers are originating in China on managing the Indo-Gangetic Plains. It's a huge, huge, huge issue. It's a catastrophe waiting to happen, but it can be avoided. Ron, we've got some great questions from the audience in our remaining uh, few minutes or so. I'd love to pepper you with a few of them. Sure. We have a couple first that are around the theme of uh, transformation. And I'm going to ask them at once because it might be might be helpful to address them together. Most South Asian countries are struggling to meet their basic necessities. Can you give practical strategy to prioritize investments for effective societal transformation alongside that? And can the 1.5 degree target be reached without drastic reduction? in consumption by industrial civilization, particularly wealthy countries like this one? Yeah. Uh, first is the practical suggestions, okay? I, I think I go back to my uh, proposal. And if you doubt my proposal, just travel in villages. My wife and I took a sabbatical just traveling from villages to villages. And I did projects in India. For them, adaptation, a heat wave comes through is first getting them sandals. Most of them wear bare feet. I've seen women and children in hot weather traveling a mile to get water from a well, okay? So if through this loss and damage, money is released, Adaptation for this poorest billionaire, same as Pakistan and Bangladesh and Nepal, I've seen it there too. Just making sure every village has a well is a huge plus, particularly for women and girls. They are the ones who have to go get the water. So when we stayed with this woman as a guest, I asked, why don't you send your teenage boy? Oh, no, 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 you know, it's below uh, dignity. This is the girls job. And having a fan would be a huge plus. So we are talking about basic stuff. Okay. And city dwellers and others, a lot has been said. So that's the kind of basic thing I'm talking about. And then having the village chief, making sure the information is fed to the chief, whether it's a she or a he, so that the, the farmers know this planting season, the rain is going to be less or more because such forecasts are made, seasonal forecasts, so that they can adjust. And the third I would suggest is what's called climate smart agriculture. You know, where you have dry land, you have to have dry land agriculture. There are ways to increase the yield. So I would first want to protect the poorest 2 billion in South and East Asia because uh, Marriott, I'm going to make an, uh, 
what I think is a drastic uh, statement. When that one and a half degree hits, so far I have no doubt it's going to hit in the next eight to 12 years, okay? That's going to cross the threshold. That will be a cliff for the poorest three billion. I don't know how deep that cliff is. You know, is it a 10 foot? They could survive a 10 foot jump. I'm talking about metaphorically, because, but if it's a hundred feet cliff, they're not going to survive. And in fact, uh, uh, I want to mention, when I mentioned this to Pope Francis, he came with an, a fantastic statement in his climate encyclical. It's a cry of the earth should be heard with the cry of the poor. Okay. And, uh, my good friend, Governor Jerry Brown said, this is the biggest human rights issue the planet faces. I agree with him. So anyway, so in terms of practical suggestions, I would focus on the middle, so-called middle 4 billion mass transit for them is key. And you got to provide them to cool themselves. They're living in this 50 story apartments, right? So how do they cool themselves? Most of them don't have air conditioning. So those are, I'm talking about practical things when we talk about adaptation. For the Western world, there are more sophisticated ways to adapt. So going back to this division between most of the emissions coming from the West and the suffering or in the global South, I think that's why the West, I think the developed nations, again, even in America, in California, in San Diego, every fifth child goes without one meal. So this poverty is everywhere. So I think the West has to focus on mitigation, cutting down the risks, and has to focus on the loss and damage. There's no question. But I, I want to inform my good friend who said this, if you are having this same conversation 2045 instead of 2022, that one trillion ton blanket will become one and a half trillion without mitigation. And two thirds of that emission would have come from Asia. So we are not going to solve this problem by pointing fingers at each other. That time is long gone. The only way we're gonna solve this is to have that societal transformation where we change the way we see each other. Okay, and the way our attitude towards each other and our attitude towards uh, the ecosystem. We are destroying the ecosystem too. So my good friend, your question is a fantastic question, but don't, Think of it in terms of pointing finger. We are never going to solve this problem that way. Thanks, Ram. Here's uh, another audience question, um, rather direct, maybe it's somebody you know. At Chicago Circuit 1987, you taught me about climate science. Now we've moved to mitigation resilience. Where must we improve models to better inform the decisions going forward? Yeah, great question. Uh, let me say one thing there. Uh, the, I was in Chicago, maybe uh, I know this person, but uh, until five years ago, I thought talking about adaptation and resilience is the biggest admission of failure, failure on part of scientists and failure on part of policymakers to address the climate change. I don't think of it anyway, because the crisis is on us. So we have to, you know, adapt. And uh, models, I, I was asked to focus more on societal issues. Models have a huge role to play. Remember, we use models to predict the degree and how warming is going to come eight years from now. But I find uh, that I'm, I may anger a lot of my climate scientists who are listening to this. Our climate models don't have human beings in them. Okay, so we need to bring in human beings explicitly in our models 
So this, so far, these models were created mainly by natural scientists, physicists, and chemists, and meteorologists. We need to bring in social scientists. Our climate model has to go through a fundamental transformation where we can put behavioral change, okay? Where we can bring in humanities experts to see, what if, if you communicate this effectively, what will happen in the future? We are not able to ask such questions. So we're not able to prioritize between adaptation, mitigation, and societal transformation. But it's it, the conversation has started and there are few groups, two or three groups I know were interacting. But by and large, I see climate scientists and modelers in their silos. That has to change. Thanks, Ram. We have about five minutes left and I wanna jam in two more questions if we can get away with it. Sure. I'll um, make it brief. <laughs> this, uh, it, it's been terrific, thank you. This this one, you know, I I think all, all of us uh, who, who have, have children and who uh, look look at our loved ones think about it. You know, we see a kind of despair among the youth and an echo anxiety among children worldwide in response to the situation we're in. What can you suggest to parents and educators? I I think. Uh... I'm in the same boat, Mariette. I know I have four grandchildren. I have three children. And my children who are all in the 30, 30, mid thirties to forties are asking me, can you tell where we can move in a climate safe place? Okay, so uh, it's a huge issue. And I can tell you what drives me uh, to keep on. Otherwise I would have become very depressed. Uh, if I'm not already, I still have enormous hope that this problem can be solved. And uh, otherwise, I wouldn't be here giving this uh, exchange, although I enjoyed it, I would be enjoying my retirement. So uh, I, see a, I see enormous hope, enormous possibility that we are going to solve this problem, okay? I think I'm just reminded of uh, what Churchill said about Americans. You can always count on Americans to do the right thing after they have tried everything else. I think it's the same true with human beings. We have tried everything else, folks. Now it's the time to do the right thing. Thanks, Ram. That's a great uh, message. So with about, we have about three minutes left, and I have a final question for you, uh, but it you know, I could imagine this could could be a, a big one, but you know, think thinking about all the ground we've covered today, you know, we've covered a, quite a lot. And one of the things I enjoyed is how uh, clarifying the way your uh, perspectives on the situation are for those of us who might otherwise get mired in the details. But what is one thing you would really like our audience to take away from today's conversation? Thank you. Uh... First, I would like you to know climate change is a solvable problem. The second is, this is a problem we have to solve it, okay? The alternate of not solving it as going business as usual is too scary a prospect, all right? But it's gonna require massive societal ecological transformation but if we manage this transformation, we are in a fantastic situation to create a sustainable society and a sustainable ecosystem for generations to come. But it's going to require top-down and bottom-down approach. So my call for action is all hands on deck. Each one of us can move that curve, bend the curve. So we don't have to wait for the uh, leaders of the world, but we need to give them support. Thank you, Mariette. We just, I enjoyed the exchange. Ram, I, uh, I thank you. I mean, I, I think we, we are left with some really helpful thoughts about it's our all hands on deck moment. We have a solvable 
problem that actually we have to solve. And if we do it right, if we work together, uh, the result would be better, healthier lives for all. Thank you so much, Ram, for your really helpful insights and inspiring words. And now, Alex, I'd like to turn it back over to you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Mariette. And thank you for your fantastic interviewing and summarizing skills. What an inspiring message to end with. Um, Ram, thank you for sharing from your life's work and for doing that work. We're uh, really pleased to be able to have this webinar series in your honor. Um, to everyone who joined us for the inaugural Ramanathan Climate Conversation, thank you. Uh, it was recorded and it will be available to view on the same web page immediately. The next Ramanathan Climate Conversation is going to be next year, but I invite you to join us on December 7th for the final climate conversation of this year about how to ensure that insurance industry in the US can continue to provide support amidst increasing climate hazards in the US um, as well. The link to register is above where you can also register for the climate at the National Academy's newsletter to get updates on all the climate work we have going on. Um, as a final reminder, to share your feedback on today's event or ideas for future events, please see the survey link. Lastly, thanks to everyone behind the scenes who supported today's event. Stay safe and have a good one. <laughs>